Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will discuss exiting the prison system and the challenges of reintegration with three individuals who have navigated this terrain. Michael Hood Bay, Danelle Felder, and Dietrich Trent. Thank you all for joining us. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results. And questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So gentlemen, I so appreciate your helping us to understand some of the challenges of, of exiting prison. And it would be great to just start off by just talking about your experiences, what you encountered in your first week out, and how things have unfolded uh, for you all. Um, let's, let's start off with uh, Danelle. Um, could you just uh, help to educate us on, on what you experienced? My experience upon my release after uh, being incarcerated for a good, good amount of years uh, throughout my life uh, was, it was somewhat in accord with what I expected. You know, I had barriers that I had to, had to over, 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 overcome and situations where I had to reframe myself, embrace myself for what was ahead of me as being gone from society for such a long time, okay? So upon me being released to the halfway house in the Washington, D.C. area, it was stipulations uh, where though you couldn't go out and meet your family right off, right off, right off as soon as you uh, arrived there and things of that nature. So you had to go through a little process, which, which, it, which, which was a good process because it, it held me you know, in accord with the, the avenue that I wanted to reach so far as me being released, okay? So after being there for like a month or so, you know, like I said, before I got released, I reached out to a, a few organizations that was uh, uh, somewhat in accord with me being able to uh, re-identify myself and get, get the necessary things that I need to uh, get myself on, the, on get my, get my, my, uh, my quota going in reference to what I wanted to do. So far as me obtaining a job, uh, my identification and my birth certificate and my social security card and things of that nature, right? So I presented that to the halfway house and they told me they were gonna give me passes to go out and retrieve some of those things, you know? So it was really a process that was, wasn't that, that hard to uh, deal with and whatnot. And they ended up guiding me in the right direction in, in reference to me being able to obtain everything that I needed to get, my, get myself going to be in back into society. You know, you know, that's, that's really, you're making an important point because you're going from one environment, right? And now you go to a halfway house and you're, you're acquiring knowledge from people who are also there, right? You can share information. And, and that sort of decompression process, you found that to be helpful in, in, in how you navigated in the first month? Was that, was that helpful? Yes. Yes, it, it was very helpful with that, you know, because some of the people in the halfway house, some of the case managers and whatnot, they, they gave me the proper proper uh, format and the guidance and the procedures that I had to go through in order to obtain the things that I needed to uh, reiterate myself in society and, and, and regain my identity as being a member of society. And Michael, did you, did you have a similar type of experience or, or uh, was, was it different from what uh, Danelle was, uh, was describing? Uh, well, it was similar to what Danielle described. Uh, however, you know, in my case, uh, I prepared myself while, while I was inside uh -huh. because, you know, I, one of my beliefs is that, you know, uh, uh, you prepare yourself for, for, for what's to come. And, and when I went out into society, uh, I already knew that, you know, I wouldn't have certain things available to me right. that I would have to, you know, push forward to get those things, such as, you know, a, a job, uh, uh, or some clothing, a place to stay. Uh, yes, I had loved ones, you know, who loved me and all, but but that love goes but so far, you know. Uh, uh, they, you know, they have a life, you know, of their own, and 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 my pushing myself. You know, in you know, into their life, you know, was just an obstacle for them. So, so I ain't want to be that that type of person. So, I, so I prepared myself to uh, search uh, 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 different organizations, such as Voices for a Second Chance, and and they 
you know, received me uh, with open arms. And, and, and that was the start of my beginning. You know, you're making such an important point, right? There's, there's a combination of self-reliance, which you are exercising, right? You, you have loved ones, but you're restraining yourself so that you don't become a burden and you're taking responsibility yourself to navigate, but you also can depend on uh, people in your family, but also others who are thinking about you. They don't know you yet, right? But when they encounter you, they're, they're thinking about how they can be of assistance. So you've got this balance of self-reliance and independence, but also sort of um, uh, cooperation, right? Right. And, and yeah. did, did you find this, 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 how, how did, how did you navigate uh, when you came out? Well, my, my, my journey, returning back to society, was kind of different in so many ways and, and unique in so many ways because I left at it at the age of 16 years old. I got turned three days out of my birthday and I returned as a 40 year old plus year old man. So my transition was totally different. I left as a child. So I'm coming back to a society that don't look nothing like or is operating nothing like I left it as a child. And not, and just me getting myself acclimated back as a, as 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 a grown man, you know, and coming back in, and that was one of the challenges I I met. But my first week out um, was my first uh, pass from from my uh, from the um, from the Hope Village. Uh, was two voices of a second chance, and through them, they helped start navigating my journey and the right path, you know, as far as my identification, get myself back, because I didn't have no ID when I, when I went to jail. I didn't, I wasn't even old enough to have an ID. So they was helping me with a lot of my important, important essential documents that I needed to gain uh, identity in society. And so, it, it, and to be honest, it was, it was smooth because I, I was blessed to uh, have people there in my presence and organizations such as Voices of a Second Chance in my presence and that was helping me in my journey. So it was it was a task, but I was up for the task because I knew that I had to educate myself in and come back out here and be, and be prepared for whatever uh, may be presented to me upon my release. And we should remind uh, just sort of everybody who is viewing here, Voices for a Second Chance is a fantastic, fantastic program that supports these journeys exiting from uh, prison and reintegration in, into society. Uh, Dietrich, you're making such an important point because things that people take for granted can't be taken for granted. Each particular uh, route, you know, when you're standing there in line trying to get an identification, right, and then the questions that people are, are asking you that, you that you have to answer, like they're, they're mundane questions, but it's a complicated act which we all take for granted. And you have to do that over and over and over again. Um, uh, when, when you, um, you all have, have applied for jobs and so on, what have you been your experience as you encounter people like me who do not necessarily have any knowledge of your lives? Uh, what do you all encounter? Um, Michael, uh, why, don't, why don't we start with you since we started with Danelle uh, just just now, and then we'll go to Dietrich and then we'll end up for now. Uh, some of the things that I've encountered uh, was, you know, you're going to knock on some doors. And, and most of the time, those doors, you know, not going to be open. But if you're persistent and, and you have a strong mind and you push forward, you know, you can knock through those doors. Uh, so, so uh, knocking on the doors, having the right equipment, you know, available to you, a bicycle, bus, car, you know, or, or, or that person who's willing, you know, to, to travel with you, 
you know, to uh, uh, obtain the things that you need. Right. Uh, these things here, you, you know, matters. Uh, we're all not going to, you know, tra travel down that same road and receive the same blessings and all. But, but I believe that, you know, if you keep pushing and if you stay positive, that eventually those things are going to come, come to you. And you're talking about the virtue of persistence, right? Patience, yes. being knocked down seven times and get up eight. And if you're knocked right. down eight times, get up nine. That's right. You're, you're talking about finding a bicycle. You're talking about walking. You're talking about public transportation, finding a friend. Um, all those things, right? I mean, every single one of those things is so important to success and not getting frustrated, right? Or being frustrated and pers persevering anyway, right? Right, Stay, staying positive. Dietrich, did you, did you find the same kind of thing? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 Mark, I, I wanted to, um, to add on to that and, I'm, and that you was coming to me that yeah. I knew that, that you know, it, I was gonna be, it was gonna be an obstacle and I'm gonna be behind the eight ball when it comes to job, you know, not only because I didn't have no job history coming, I was a juvenile and didn't have a job, never worked for nowhere. So I educated myself why I was incarcerated to, to some of the things that I know that going to be geared towards me to be successful and, and took some classes that really didn't have no interest in. But I just said, just always just something to do. So when I did come home, I had me they got a job with a, uh, doing training at a gym at LA Fitness. And it wasn't to my liking as I thought it would be to my liking. So I actually quit the job. And a lot of people said, you're doing this wrong. But I said, no, I need job training skills. I said, I don't have no job training skills to, you know, and I need to do something that's going to make me happy. And this is not going to make me happy. So this is not, I, and it's not about the money. And I know I need the job training skills. And I didn't have that inside when I was incarcerated. I didn't have any job training skills. So I went to a job training skill for, for over six months. And and, and, and and it led me to my occupation that I'm doing currently, at, and which I love and, and, and cherish and is my passion. So it really wasn't so much of us. I knew what was out there to uh, take advantage of. And I just utilize everything that was available to me as being a DC prisoner, I mean, as a DC returning citizen. And I took advantage of it. And, and you know, I know everybody's journey is not the same, Mark, and, but I just say my journey was a little different and I'm blessed and I'm you know, kind of figured by that. So, uh, so admirable to develop the self-advocacy skills and the self-possession to know that that wasn't your heart's desire and find a different job that is more aligned to what you want. You know, um, we, we asked a poll just now and, and we just gotten the results. Should those who have served time and who do not reoffend have the same rights and privileges as other Americans? And 100% of the people said yes. But what you're describing, uh, Michael and Dietrich, is that while the answer is yes, the route is extremely challenging. Danelle, what was your experience when, when, uh, when you um, interacted with people as you were seeking a job and, and other things? I uh, had the, uh, uh, the privilege of, uh, uh, of, of obtaining a job at this organization throughout the halfway house called Project Empowerment. And what they do is they take you to three weeks of extensive training on how to conduct yourself at an interview, how to fill out the paperwork, and what to say and what not to say at the interview. Three weeks. So three weeks of intensive training and whatnot, right? That was the first job that I really went on since I went uh, upon my release from, from, from prison, right? And uh, after I obtained my, uh, my identification from uh, this, this great organization that I looked up uh, in the law library upon my release, which is Voices for a Second Chance, and I reached out to them upon my release and they told me as soon as I, I, I come home to come to the organization, they will help me obtain all the necessary stuff that I need to get my identity back. So like I said, like Mr. Uh, Mr. Trent said, the first place I went to uh, when I got the pass to leave out the Hayway House 
was was for a second chance. And they sent me down with a case manager, took me through the process for me to regain my identity and all, get all the necessary paperwork that I need. So after that, like a couple of weeks later, the uh, halfway house uh, picked a few of us, like 10 of us, to go down to what's for a second chance and, and enter to try to get into the program. So I ended up getting chosen to be in the program. And I went through the intensive training for three weeks and they, they gave me, put me in the right direction. And upon it, I graduated, went through the class and took it in a, and I prevailed. And I graduated and ended up obtaining a job as a maintenance man. It's something that's up my alley out in Silver Spring, Maryland. You know, it, it was an easy process. I, I didn't really have any, any issues, you know, uh, during that time with that job. But that job ended up, ended up uh, being a, uh, uh, disqualified because of the fact that they end up uh, the company end up uh, hiring their own people. So what I did, I went down to this tip agency that I, I reached out to uh, upon my release, and they had got back with me, you know, and told me that if I still need a job to come down there. So I ended up going down there, ended up getting a job as a utility worker at the Air and Space Museum. And one of the processes that I had to go through, in in, in a denying aspect, was that I was working for a contract company called Compass, the Compass Group, you know, Restaurant and Associates. Right. And we wasn't in like, like the Smithsonian is a federal, is a federal place, right? So uh, about a month later into me working my job, I get a call from the security uh, uh, a person that, that looks over the application. And he got to telling me, you know, he asked me about my, the nature of my charges for which that I went to prison for. Right. And I told him that, you know, he asked me, could I send him the paperwork? Because I ended up sending him the paperwork, right? But not knowing that he really don't have anything to do with me because I'm under contract with him. If the contract, I, I cleared the clearance with the job that hired me, there was no need for him to really keep contact me in reference to that. So I ended up applying with him anyway and sent him all the information that he asked for. And he got back with me and told me there was some serious crimes, serious challenges and stuff like that, right? And he was trying to basically knock me from working in the Air and Space Museum, not knowing that I already got cleared from the compass uh, restaurant and soapies group that I got hired for. So it that took me through a loop and I was like, why, you know, you know, I, I served a, a number amount of years in prison. And I'm like, why is this man taking me through this unnecessary changes about something that happened 20 or 30 years ago? You know, but he kept persisting on, asking me, you know, come over to his office and, and we talking about the situation and whatnot. But I, I never I never denied him anything. I just told him the truth about everything that happened to me and my situation that me being incarcerated, right? So he said he'll get back with me. So now I uh, was working and still working my job as utility worker for the compass group under contract. And my, my uh, supervisor asked me one day, she, she noticed that I had my identification card on, which I was waiting for th those people, uh, the federal aspect of the uh, air space to send me my identification card. Right. And I told her I never had it. So she ended up calling over there and asked me, you know, if I have an uh, identification card, Mr. Felder? And she told me that I was sitting over there for four or five months ago, but never, not, nobody never informed me that the ID was ready for me. So, you know, I was sitting there, you know, because you know, I have to have my ID, when, right. you know, working inside the building because we're on the contract, you know, and I have to be accountable everywhere I go throughout the Air Space Museum. So we end up getting our identification card, but he was the one that holding it up for some reason or another, right? But, but, but the fact remains that, you know, the bandit box situation is a law that, that I have read throughout the head house, they put me on put me on, on top of it saying what they can and cannot do, right? And it's on you if you want to you're in it, uh, uh, fill them in on some of the aspects on your incarceration when I that's if you choose to, you know what I'm saying? Right. right. You're, you know? You're, you're making a really important point, right? And and just to inform everybody who is viewing, the Bound the Box um, uh, initiative is about uh, there is a box on a lot of employment applications which asks the question as to whether somebody has exited prison, have, have they served time? And what that does is it creates a flag. And which, what Donnell is, is sharing with us is that um, people feel empowered to take processes into their own hands and make lives more difficult. Um, that it's not that they're badly intentioned, or maybe they are, um, but you end up having extra hurdles, right, for somebody like Danell or Michael or Dietrich, um, you have extra hurdles that everybody is empowered to put in front of, of people who are uh, trying to, to uh, build their lives, right, Danell? Yes, sir. You know, I think that that, that just 
us understanding, all of us, the four of us here and, and those watching, us, us understanding, um, you know, the intent that you have in trying to build your life and to contribute. And, and our role in trying to make that easier is really helpful. Michael, have you encountered any of that kind of um, sort of surreptitious, uh, behind the scenes kind of um, uh, sabotage uh, in, in your own uh, experience as, 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 you've, um, as you've navigated after your, after your time? No, uh, when I came home, uh, searching, search, searching for a job, you know, was easy because I had a roadmap and, and my roadmap was, uh, uh, the, the things that I left behind in prison, you know, uh, I had individuals, other inmates, you know, who, who pushed me to get out and back into society because they seen something in me that I didn't see in myself. And, and they encouraged me, you know, to go for it. You know, yes, it's gonna be doors, you know, that I'm gonna knock on and I, you know, it's, it's not gonna be answered, you know, you know but, but I had to push forward, you know, and, and go after the opportunities that presented itself. Uh, when I came out, uh, I got a, a construction job. Now, now this this wasn't the field that I wanted to pursue, but but it was there for me. So so I, so I took that, and and while while I'm working there, you know, I kept my focus on other avenues, and I kept putting you know those those uh, 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 paperwork in for this job and that job, and eventually I got the job that I wanted. You know, so it's just perseverance. You know, and having you know a keen sense, you know, to uh, stay focused and look forward. Well, thank thank you. I mean that that persistence is is so important. Uh, Dietrich, when when you're now um, employed in a job that you like, you have colleagues around you who um, are are supportive. Um, we just took a, a, a poll. And um, half of the people roughly said that it's important before um, they were to offer a job um, or an apartment that they know whether somebody has served time. What do you think about that? Is it important for people to know or is it, is it, um, is it better to just say, you know, I paid my debt to society. That's really my information. What do you think? That's a tough question, Bob. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> No, but I think it's very important, right? Because we gotta be, we have as, as, um, as an ex-offender, I have to be as mindful as, as well that other people has rights as well, right? I want my rights to be respected. They want their rights to be respected, right? So I have to be reminded, they need to know something about me. I have, you know, I have to feel free, especially when I'm, all, I'm I need something of their service, right? And if it was vice versa, and the same thing, why it happened to me um, that I had to let someone know about my history and where I come from, and I don't, I don't hide from who I am because I'm uh, on my past because it made me who I am today. So I know that my mistake, what I happened in life, didn't define who Dietrich Trent is as today. So I'd be gladly to tell people, yes. This is what happened in the past. I had did this as many well, many years in prison. But today, if I wouldn't have never told you none of this, you would never know that DJ Ernst just sit, sit in prison for over 25 years of his life. So I don't, I let people know that this is the journey that I went through and this is who I am now. So I help inspire young youth. That's why I choose the job that I am, I, which I do, I work, because I was told I couldn't work with youth because due to my nature of my offense, like Brother Darnell said, and me being locked up. But I knew as a 16-year-old being placed into adult prison and the growth that I had to go through, I knew I was a vital and a, and a, and a messenger for the youth back in my, in my community. Coming back there and letting them know, hey, you don't want to go through the journey I went through, and this is the blueprint not to go through that. So I was told that I couldn't work with youth. But like 
like Brother Hood said, I was persistent. I said, man, y'all are the people that are supposed to be helping me with my job training skills and telling me I'm not supposed to go there, but this is what I want to do. So I went on being persistent, like Brother Hood said, and said, I'm going to go on the interview that you sent me to because I'm not in a position to turn no job down. Right. And the funny thing about it, the job did turn me down, which was a trainer's job, but I did went on and, sit and said, I'm going to keep pushing forward, and I met the right people, and now I work for uh, the Office State of Superintendent of Education, uh, D.C. Reengagement Center, where I work with 16 through 24 year, 25 years old of youth, helping them get themselves back on track for uh, getting them back in high school and getting their GEDs. And if they facing uh, any barriers in life, I help remove them out of their life bars. If it could be incarceration, they need child care, they need Medicaid, anything to help their life to be better so they can achieve their high school diploma and GED, that's what I do. So I wouldn't allow nobody to stop me, even though I knew that I had to tell people who my history was and who where I come from and who I am. I knew that was their rights as well. And so I'm in agreement that everybody should know you know, who you are as a person, because I would want to know too, my mom. You know, you're, you, you saw that, that the background failed uh, for, for a bit, right? There's so much about our lives today that is illusion, right? This background is an illusion. It's a green screen and back, right? We see in Hollywood, a lot of what, what, what people present, whether they're business people or, or entertainment people, it's based on illusion and perception. And what you're saying is that I'm living in the real world. I am going to share my reality with someone else. You're doing it right now. Yes. You're, you're being a voice for a second chance. You all are. Um, yes. and, and what you're doing is you're allowing me to deal with your reality because you're not giving me illusion. And I think that's a very courageous thing. It's a very courageous thing. Yes. In terms of in terms of what needs to change here uh, in our society, um, I, I'd like you all to weigh in. Let's let's start off as as we we did it the first time. Uh, Danelle, if you can if you can start off, and then Michael and Dietrich will give you the last word. But if you could just give us, if there was one thing that that we could change. Um, what would you change, Danelle? Um, I uh, would like to see the change uh, in reference to the re-entry re -entry process of uh, return citizens. Uh, there's one, one aspect that, 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 that is, is a burden right now, is a problem, right, within the, the nation's capital, which is Washington, D.C., right? Uh, we have all types of uh, organizations, you know, throughout the city that's willing to help everybody that's returning, a returning citizen, right? But one has to apply itself, you know, and prepare itself, you know, to reach out to the different organizations so they can get that help, right? Oh, but right, as it stands now, uh, upon most of most of the pre people from the Washington DC area released, they really don't have no no outlet or nowhere really to go because the simple fact that the, the, the process that I went through with them coming to the halfway house in the Washington DC area is no longer there for anybody else that's getting released in, in the future. So as it stands now, they have to go like to Baltimore at a re-entry center up there, which they're not from Baltimore, and they're from the Washington DC area, right? And I would like to see a change in that area where though they have some type of proper proper uh, leeway, you know, the, the halfway house, you know, like I went through. So people that's coming home now will have a, 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 a Place to go, where though they can get pointed in the right direction, right direction as I, I I had the opportunity to do. You know, like I said, the halfway house was kind of helped. It was very helpful to me and whatnot. You know, it was a little little ups and downs throughout of it, but I had to brace myself, like I say, and, and deal with the situation at hand and, and and go through the process. You know, that you need to do to get out the halfway house, in which I succeeded, right? And I feel as though it's a very need at, at this time for people that's getting released back to the Washington D.C. area for some place you know as positive as the halfway house was. You know, for them to come to and get pointed in the right direction, and so they can be a, 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 a member of society once again. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. If if there was uh, one thing you'd want to change, or one message that you want people to take away from this, uh, what would that be from your perspective? Well, Mark, first let me say that uh, you know, I, you know, I went to prison, in 1976. I was age 17, and 
I wound up doing 41 years in prison. Not straight, but eventually I, I did 41 years in prison. And, you know, the one thing that I would like to change in all of that there is that parole, the guidelines. The guidelines for parole is it's stressful for most people returning home, and and to keep up with with the uh, the rules and regulations that you know they push on us, you know it's a, it's impossible for most. Some of us, you know, can keep that positive frame of mind, you know, and don't let it ag agitate us, you know, in a way, you know, that that we can su su succeed. But others, you know, uh, uh, they. They might want to take that drink, you know, or 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 talk talk to you know their friend on the corner or next door, you know. So, provoke guidelines and and the expungement of of a person's sentence so that they can continue to forward themselves on in the future. Those those are things that I would like to change. So that so that parole is is such a complicated web of restrictions that you're kind of set up for failure as opposed to being set up for success in your view. Yes, it's a catch twenty two. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for providing that insight. And Dietrich, what is um, what is your one thing that you'd like people to either change or learn from from uh, from you I will, you know, it's this this to hit directly home when it comes to juvenile justice but it, but not just the juvenile justice the juvenile justice when it comes to mental health right and I've seen a lot of my my brothers that that was my peers that was my age, decelerate inside them prison walls because they, their mental capacity wasn't strong enough to take the abnormal, the abnormal conditions that we was placed in as juveniles, right? And a lot of trauma, you know, took over their mind. And I seen that nothing was done for the benefit of their health. And they're being released back into society after all these years and no treatment, no true treatment dealing with these juveniles. They just, yeah, they committed crimes, but let's help. These minds are still being developed and there's no data. There's no nothing, nobody scientifically trying to really catch it. Yeah, they talk about letting them go after so many years, but let's talk about what's going on in the walls while they're there. The trauma that they that they could compound on their mind for being there as juveniles, being housed with adults, right, and and have to uh and have to hurry quickly and operate as an adult in a in, in a statistically real. I mean, being honest, a violent environment, right, all over again. So this I seen a lot of my friends, a lot of peers, and a lot of other, and I know. Mr. Donnell and Mr. Brotherhood could speak and, 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 and contest to this, that they come home and then they end up catching recidivism rate, keep going back in and out of their prison. You know why? Because nothing never been attested to them when it comes to their mental health. No one asked them, hey, is you all right? I've been doing these many years. And, and to be honest, and, and I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Paula Thompson because she was the first person, and I'm not saying this because of Voice of Sex Ed, but she was the first person that asked me after coming home for after 25 years and sat me down and said, are you all right? I don't care about your ID. I don't care about none of that, none of this. I know what you came to my organization for. She said, but I need to talk to you. Are you all right, baby? And I said, that was one of the most testing things that ever happened to me because it, it, it showed me that people do care out here after you look after someone come home. But fortunate enough, I was, you know, I was strong enough to educate my mind 
and not get caught up to some of the card with and some of the spy with that was planted and systematic inside the prison for us to fail. I was able to navigate my way out of there and get and and, and, and come back to society as a productive human, uh, as a human being and, and as a grown man. But I seen a lot of my brothers that's, that didn't. And there's a lot of more that's not gonna be able to do it. So that's the thing that I want. We need to find some way. Then this is a globally thing. This is not a DC. No, this is right. globally. These are our youth that, that we, that has been locked up as youth is returning back home as perps. They don't know how to perp because they, 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 don't, they don't know. So these are, I'm passionate about this when it comes to juvenile justice, mental health. Man, because I think that's something that really need to be um yes, thank you. So your your point is so important. The the idea that uh, people inside need to work through their trauma. They need to have help in navigating. You found it in your own heart, in your own head, through people who inside were able to mentor you and you've mentored other people, but we could do a lot better job in helping people and setting them up for success rather than, as you said, recidivism and so on. There are programs like Voices for a Second Chance all across the nation. Uh, 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 one of our uh, viewers suggested that we also look at uh, the Tracy Sranks, author of From the Block to the Boardroom, and uh, you can you can find uh, on YouTube. But there are so many resources. We did a poll, and 75% of the individuals who responded said that they have never hired or rented a, a, an apartment to somebody who has exited, but they would be willing to do so. So there are resources out there, and there's wisdom from people like yourself who have been through the system that is accessible to, to all of us in America to, to help improve the situation. I want to thank you and salute you for the courage that you've shown in sharing your stories with us. Um, that's the nonprofit report. Thank you all, Danelle Felder, Michael Hood, and Dietrich Trent. Thank you all for your help in understanding this very complicated subject. We really appreciate it.